The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear, but mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. The story you're about to hear concerns one of the most unusual killers in the annals of crime. A brutal murderer who carries not one but four deadly weapons wherever he goes. A huge monster of a creature weighing hundreds of pounds. But this isn't a horror story. In a way, it's a love story. It's called The Horse That Wasn't For Sale. And now that you've heard the title, you've already guessed the identity of our killer. But that doesn't mean you know what Stargazer is really like. No! No, you keep away from me, you hear? Get back, Stargazer! Get back! Get away! Get away! Stop it! Please, somebody, somebody stop him! Save me! Our mystery drama, The Horse That Wasn't For Sale, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our tale begins in an idyllic setting. Just picture the gently rolling hills of a horse farm in the early days of autumn. The colors of the trees all red and rust and differing shades of amber. See the ranch house nestled comfortably in the valley. The long row of white stables. But now you may notice something unusual about this farm. The stables are empty. No horses neigh and whinny in the paddocks. The only sound is the tapping of a typewriter. And at a desk in the front room sits a very handsome and very sad-looking young lady whose name is Chrissy Runyon. Judge Simmons, I thought it was only fair that I tell you the whole story about Stargaze here so that at least you'll know the animal isn't entirely to blame for what happened. It began on the day my father was buried. And, of course, it began with our trainer, Clem Burnett, he was all alone at Runyon Farms that day, and he took advantage of the fact to sample some of Daddy's best bourbon. <laughs> ah, shut up, you. Stand still if you want to get brushed. Ah, what's the matter with you? Stand still, you mangy beast. Ah, oh, for the love of there goes the blasted phone now. I ain't got one job to do, it's another. All right, all right. All right, all right, I'm coming. Hello. Mr. Burnett, it's Chrissy Runyon. Oh, hello, Miss Runyon. How is everything out there? Oh, everything's fine, just fine. What about Bobolink? Is she still off her feet? Ah, Bobolink's fine, just fine. Are you all right, Mr. Burnett? Sure, sure I am. Everything out here is just the way it should be. Ah, uh, tell me, how was the funeral? I'm calling to ask about the horses, Mr. Burnett. Is Stargazer still... Restless. Well, that horse ain't been nothing but restless since the day he was foaled. Well, then don't trouble him, Mr. Burnett. Do you understand? Just let him be, and I'll take care of him when I get out there. Huh? You mean you're coming out? Of course I'm coming out. Why shouldn't I? Oh, no reason, no reason. I just thought, well, you ain't been here in a long time, Miss Runyon. Yes, well, I have to arrange things for the auction. Huh? Auction? What are you talking about? I'm sorry, Mr. Burnett, but the horses have to be sold. And the farm, too. My father's debts were, too. Uh, well, never mind. I'll, I'll be there sometime this weekend. Oh, wait a minute. 
You're telling me that I'm out of a job? I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do about it. Now, look here. I worked six years on this place. Six years and your old man never gave me more than a... I'll see you on the weekend, Mr. Burnett. And we'll settle then about your wages. And remember what I said about Stargazer. Just let him alone. Goodbye. Ah. Just like that, huh? Just like that, huh, Miss Snooty? I let him alone, all right. He can starve as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, what's the matter, Stargazer? You don't look so happy today. Hungry, maybe, huh? Thirsty? No, there's no use pawing the ground. You just got to wait until she gets here. Miss Chrissy Runyon is the only one you ever cared for, right? Well, you can wait until she gets here and takes care of you, because I won't. <laughs> hey, now get down. Get down, Stargazer. Now you stop that. Ah, what are you trying to do? Knock down the whole barn? Now stop that. You stop it. All right. All right. If you want a taste of a whip. Ah, now stop it. Stop it, you crazy beast. Get back there. Get back. Me. You kicked me. No. No. Oh, my God. Well, you know what happened to Clem Burnett better than I do, Judge Simmons. You viewed the remains of his body for the inquest. That was something I couldn't bring myself to do. I'm sure you remember the day after the hearing. When you asked me to dinner. <laughs> Please, Judge, why don't you tell me what's really on your mind? It's about Stargazer. Well, I appreciate your accepting this date. I know you're anxious to get back to the city. No, I'm anxious to get back to my home, Judge. Yes. It's hard to think that Runyon Farms isn't your home anymore. It hasn't been for years. You know that Daddy and I didn't get along. Yes, yes, I know that only too well. Your father used to say, the only thing that keeps Chrissy coming back is that horse, Stargazer. Hmm. And you were right the first time. It's that horse. Yeah? What about it? Well, I think you know, Chrissy. Even though I handed down the verdict I did about poor Clem... Do you know what that man was doing to Stargazer? As I heard testimony, remember? Well, it's the truth, Judge. He was deliberately starving the poor animal. He was depriving it of feed and water. And that's why Stargazer did what he did. Uh, Chrissy, Chrissy, stop thinking that animals are so aware of human motives. Well, I love horses, too, but well, I don't give them that much credit. Well, they know cruelty from kindness... And you think it was merely Burnett's cruelty that made Stargazer stomp him to death? Yes, I do. Then what about Clayton? Well, what about him? Clayton wasn't killed. Are you telling me that he wouldn't have been killed if your father hadn't reached the stable in time? I didn't know that you knew about Clayton. Your father told me himself. I didn't realize you... He swore me to secrecy because... Well, because he knew how much you loved Stargazer. He's my horse, Judge. Daddy gave him to me. Yes, but he didn't know that he was giving you a killer. Oh, don't say that. You can be glad I didn't say it at the inquest, Chrissy. Now, I was tempted to, let me tell you. It was only the fact of you sitting there with those big blue eyes of yours filled with tears. That... Oh, I was crying for my father. Yes, yes, yes of course. But you were crying for your stargazer, too. Now, you're afraid the verdict would be against the animal and that, that somebody would have to put a bullet in that proud head. Oh, Judge, please don't say such things. Chrissy, you're not going to allow stargazer to be sold, now, are you? Is that why you wanted this lunch, to ask me that? The horse cannot be ridden. Not even you would dare ride him again. A horse doesn't have to be ridden. Chrissy, your beautiful stallion is mad. Mad? Killer mad. The way some animals get when they're treated just a little too coolly. But Stargazer wasn't ever treated that badly. Well, between Clayton and Burnett and you, you... Me? Yes, Chrissy. Yours was the greatest cruelty of all. What do you mean? 
Your horse loved you, child, and you left him. You went out of his life, and you stayed out of it. Well, I was in college. And afterwards, oh, Judge, I did have a life to live. I didn't want to live it under the thumb of my father. Yes, yes, and Stargazer forgot kindness and learned indifference and cruelty, and he went mad. Now, you have to do something for him. Judge, please listen to me. I know he's valuable, Chrissy. And I know your father left you with too many creditors, and Stargazer will probably bring you a higher price than any other horse on the list. Eight, maybe ten thousand from the stud farm. Judge Simmons, you needn't have worried. I made up my mind about that even before Stargazer, even before Burnett was killed. He's not for sale. You mean that, Chrissy? I'm putting every single horse up for auction, but not... Stargazer. Just a moment. Good morning. Oh. Hello. Well, you remember me, don't you? Alan Carlin from Wildbrook Farm? Yes, of course I remember you, Mr. Carlin. Why, I thought you might have forgotten me. It's been a couple of years since we've seen each other, Miss Runyon. I remember you. In fact, I saw you at the auction. Well, well, I'm flattered that you noticed me. You bought three of my father's horses. Yes, yes, I bought three. I, I meant to buy four. Uh, listen, do you mind if I, if I come in? Oh, please do. I, uh, I was really shocked when I heard he died. He wasn't a youngster, of course, but just the same. Well, my father was 71. Yeah, but I always figured he was younger, seeing as how he had such a young daughter. <laughs> but I know it took Will a long time to get around to marrying. He was practically 40 by then, wasn't he? But then, that's how your father was, always putting things off. Including paying his bills, huh? Is that why you're here, perhaps? I beg your pardon. No, I know that you are on my father's list of creditors. Oh, but that's that's not the reason I came to see you. You see, I bought three horses at your auction, but I meant to buy four. The only reason I didn't was because the horse I really wanted wasn't for sale. Huh. You mean Stargazer. Well, I, I suppose you think I believe those rumors about the animal? Well, I don't. I've been around horses all my life. A good thoroughbred doesn't go crazy overnight. So any compunction you might have about selling him... You're mistaken. Stargazer was kept out of the auction at my request. He's my horse, and I don't want him sold. Well, I attended the inquest, you know. I, I listened to every word, and I know Burnett mistreated the animal. That's why he got stopped. Mr. Burnett was a fine trainer. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. The point is that I'm willing to take my chances, Miss Runyon. I won't ask you to cut the price because of a horse's reputation. There's no price tag on him. I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Runyon, you're still a sporting woman, aren't you? Would you be willing to make a, a little wager? What? Well, I've ridden horses with reputations five times worse than stargazers, and I can prove it. Now, if I do, will you talk about a sale? No. <laughs> oh, you're your father's daughter, all right. Everybody said Will ought to raise mules that would have been more in character. Now, look, you don't have to worry about me. I was born in a saddle. If anything happens, a responsibility will be all mine. Your responsibility? Do you really think I care what happens to you? Yeah, but nothing will. If you were at that inquest, you know what it means if Stargazer hurts anybody again. They'll destroy him, and they'll have the legal right to put him away. And I won't let that happen. But it won't be that way. It will. There is something wrong with Stargazer. I've known that for a long time. And I think Daddy knew it, too, but he gave him to me thinking that I might win him over with kindness. Well, I failed, you see. And now when he feels that hateful weight on his back, he... Oh, please, please, 
Go, Mr. Carlin, please. All right, Miss Runyon. I'm just so terribly sorry you won't let me prove you wrong. Oh. oh, dear. I should start my packing. Feels like the whole morning is gone. Oh, no. I hope that man isn't bothering Stargazer. We must be out at the stable. Mr. Carlin, don't. Please don't. Mr. Carlin, don't. Mr. Carlin, stop. Bring him back here. Don't ride him. And so Mr. Alan Carlin, horse fancier, has taken a fancy to a killer horse. But Mr. Carlin won't admit he can't win Stargazer's heart and perhaps win Stargazer himself. We'll find out what becomes of both of them when I return shortly with Act Two. And now, here's Act Two of The Horse That Wasn't For Sale. Alan Carlin knows horses, knows the feel of them, the moods of them, knows when they respond to a rider's touch and knows when they resent it. But there are times when even the best horseman allows his ego to override his common sense. And Alan Carlin is about to learn that his time is now. Okay, boy. Take it easy now. Easy. Slow it down, boy. Come on. Those branches. Oh, good Lord, Stargazer. Slow it down, boy. <laughs> that tree. No. Oh. oh, God, my back. My spine. <laughs> crazy horse, she was right. You are crazy. No, 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 no. You keep away from me. Get back. You get back there, Stargazer. You get away, get away. Don't stop it. Somebody, please, somebody stop him. Save me. Police department. Hello. I want to report it. I want to report a missing animal. A horse. Uh, who is this, please? Uh, my name is Runyon, Christine Runyon. Oh, yes, Miss Runyon. This is Sergeant Pegg. Oh, Sergeant, one of my horses was removed from... I mean, uh, he ran away. Oh, I thought all your animals were auctioned off, Miss Runyon. No, no, there's one that wasn't sold. His name is... Listen, maybe he's still around the farm somewhere. Maybe I better just go out and look for him. Well, if you want to give me a description of the animal... No, please... no, no, it's all right. I just... Lost my head for a minute. I'm sure he's around the property somewhere, and I'll find him. But don't worry. Um, whatever you say, Miss. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to have troubled you. Goodbye. Of course, I knew that Stargazer wasn't around the farm. I knew where Stargazer was. Somewhere near the woods with Alan Carlin on his back, if he was still safely in the saddle. And I knew that I had to find them. I saw Carlin's automobile parked outside, and I decided to take it instead of my own, so that I could send Mr. Carlin back where he belonged. I just hoped and prayed that I wasn't too late. <laughs> I hated driving. All my life I preferred a saddle to a driver's seat. But I drove Alan Carlin's car like a reckless idiot, taking every curve as if it was a race course. Stargazer must have been traveling swiftly because there was still no sign of them when the road ended and became a forest trail. Only a horse could travel that pathway. So I stopped the car. I wasn't afraid of the forest. I'd spent half my life on a trail that led into the deepest parts of it. 
But now, for the first time, I felt afraid of it. Afraid of what it might conceal. And then I heard a sound that froze me in my tracks. Stargazer! Stargazer, where are you? Stargazer! Mr. Carlin! Oh, thank heavens you're all right, Stargazer. You are. Oh, dear God. No! Mr. Carlin, he's been thrown. Oh, I warned you not to do this. He just won't be ridden. Nobody can ride Stargazer, not even me. You're lucky you weren't... Oh, no. Oh, no, it's a head. Oh, no. <laughs> you killed him. He's dead. He trampled to death. Oh, dear God. How could you let this happen? It isn't right. It isn't right. No, 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 Stargazer. I'm not angry. Not with you. My poor animal. No, it's his fault. It's all his fault. Oh, damn you, Carlin. Why did you make this happen? Why? No, don't. Don't worry. Don't worry, Stargazer. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. That wouldn't be fair. It just wouldn't be. Only what can I do? They'll find out. Somebody will find out. <laughs> I looked at Carlin's dead body. And I thought, what if I simply left it there? Just left it. To yesterday's dead leaves and this year's snow. By the time they found him, Stargazer would be safe with me in Washington. But then I realized that would never work. They'd see the hoof marks on his face. They'd know. That policeman I called would remember, and they'd come for Stargazer, and they'd put a bullet in his head. No. No, I couldn't leave Alan Carlin there. Not with the story of his death so clearly marked on his face and his body. Well, maybe there was something else I could do. What if I obscured the story of that death. What if I just obliterated it? Yes. That was my answer. Helen Collins' automobile was only a hundred yards away. If I could get him there, I, I bent down and put my hands under his arms. And I tried to lift him. He was so heavy. Dead weight. Oh, how could I drag him to the car? No, it was impossible. I could only move him a few inches along the ground. The slippery leaves beneath his body helped a little bit. I just didn't have the strength. And then Stargazer gave me the answer. If I could manage to secure the body to his harness, if I could attach it somehow to the reins, or even to the stirrup, it was horrible, I knew that. But the thought of what might happen to Stargazer was even more horrible, more unbearable. And finally, <laughs> finally, I managed it. I dragged that man's body out of the woods, using Stargazer as my strength. And, and I put Alan Carlin into his own automobile. And I started the engine. There was only one logical place to take him. It was the canyon road, of course. I knew how steep that drive was, how dangerous it was. That's why so few cars traveled it. And that was lucky for me, the fact that the road was empty, because it made what I had to do so much easier. It almost seemed like a sign from heaven that what I was doing was right. And then, at the beginning of a steep grade, I stopped the car. And I looked at the edge of the precipice. And then I looked at Alan Carlin's body. And for a moment, my nerve deserted me. But then I put down the parking brake. I shifted the car into drive, and I got out. And I reached below the dashboard and released the handbrake. And for a moment, I thought I'd have to push the car to start it sliding down the grade toward the edge. But then, 
gravity became my confederate and the car began to move of its own accord. The door slammed shut as the wind caught it and with gathering momentum it headed straight for the guardrail, straight for the canyon below. And the guardrail gave way and the car and the man and the whole horrible problem went over the edge. And when it struck the bottom, the impact was so shattering, I knew that Stargazer could never possibly be implicated in that man's death. <coughs> then I made the long walk back to the woods, back to my horse, to my old friend, who stood patiently tethered, waiting for me, trusting in me. Sergeant Beggs. Oh, uh, you, yes, Sergeant. Well, I just thought I'd call and see if you had any luck about uh, finding your horse, I mean. Oh, uh, yes, I, I found him. I uh, was foolish to have panicked. He, he hadn't gone very far after all. Oh, good, good. Still on the property. You mean, yes, huh? yes, 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 he was. That was silly of me. He was just a short distance away. Well, that's fine. That's just fine. I'm glad to hear it. Better make sure you keep that uh, stable door locked. Huh? Uh, yes, I will. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sergeant. You're welcome, Miss Runyon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I think I could use a drink. Oh, no. No, what? Hello. Uh, hello, is this Miss, um, is, is it, uh, Bunyan? No, the name is Runyon. Who is this? Well, uh, you wouldn't know me, Miss Bunyan. I mean, uh, Miss Runyon. Name's Sam Fryatt. I work over at Wildwood Farm for uh, Mr. Carlin, you know. Yes. Oh, what do you want? Well, I was wondering if you were going to be home this afternoon, Miss Runyon. A little something I wanted to talk to you about. No, I'm sorry. I have a great number of things to do today. I can't receive visitors. Well, I, I figured you'd want to talk to me, Miss Runyon, on account of uh, what happened this morning. Oh. What do you mean? I think you know what happened out there on that canyon road. I haven't the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Uh, sure you do, Miss Runyon. You see, I saw you kill Mr. Carlin out there. I saw you murder him. Now, can I come and talk to you? <laughs> There's a famous old saying that we've all become familiar with lately. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. At the moment, it looks as if Chrissy Runyon has woven herself a tangled web and one in which she herself seems to be caught. But we'll learn exactly how tangled her affairs are when we return shortly with Act Three. Here's the final act of The Horse That Wasn't For Sale. And it begins with a sound that strikes terror into the heart of young Chrissy Runyon. She hesitates before she answers it, afraid of the man who might be on her doorstep. Miss Runyon? Yes. I'm, uh, Sam Fry. Yes. Oh. Come in. Well, it's, uh, Nice of you to see me, Miss Runyon. Who are you, Mr. Fryatt? I've never seen you around here before. Well, I'm new, Miss Runyon. I, I come from out of state. Yeah, I used to work in West Virginia at the Algonquin Farm. You know it? I heard of it. Yeah, well, I used to be a trainer there a long, long time ago. Then they had me doing grooming work and junk like that. I, I said no more of that, I said. Mr. Fryatt, will you please come to the point? What did you mean about Mr. Carlin? I don't know what you saw or think you saw. I seen you, Miss Runyon. I seen what you did. Well, whatever you think you saw, you were mistaken. 
I didn't even know your boss, Mr. Carlin. And to accuse me of killing him... Oh, but that's what you did, all right. Now, you pushed that car over the cliff, and poor Mr. Carlin was in it. My, my, you, you must have really hated that man. Well, what did he ever do to you? Uh, get fresh or something? Mr. Fryatt, you're completely wrong. I swear you're mistaken. Well, all righty then, I'm wrong. So you don't mind if I tell the police what I saw? Now, I figure they're not so dumb they could go looking for footprints or something up there, like tire tracks and stuff like that. If it, it, it was an accident... Of course, sir. I don't have to tell them what I saw. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, what I said. Ain't no law saying a man has to tell everything he knows. And what would stop you? Oh, if I liked a person. No, that's not what you really mean, is it? Now, you take Mr. Carlin. Well, I only worked for the man a week, and I could tell already that he wasn't such a nice fella. Now, I did not kill Mr. Carlin. Oh, sure, Miss Runyon. But you see, there I was in that canyon, taking a ride on the old nag they let me use, and I seen that car stop there. And now, just for the heck of it, I put my field glasses on it. <laughs> That's how I come to see it all. But you don't understand why I did it. Oh, heck, I don't care why. Now, I told you I didn't like the man. Mm, sure could sit a horse, though. Now, I'll, I'll give him that. I swear to you, he was already dead. You know, people around here know that he treated your pa pretty bad. <laughs> Can't blame you for what you did. Well, you must believe me. Mr. Carlin was already dead when his car went over into the canyon. He'd been killed by... by an accident. I had my reasons for doing what I did. Sure, Miss Shore, you did. And you can just tell the police all about it. No, no, they may not understand. Yeah, yeah that's true enough. Yeah, they may not understand. I mean, not the way I do. But just the same, if they ask me questions about it, now, I'd have to tell them what I know. Well, unless, of course, uh, I wasn't around to tell them anything. Not around? Well, with Mr. Carlin dead, there's not much point in me hanging around Wildbrook much longer. Maybe I ought to move on. You know, find me another job. If I did that, well, <laughs> I wouldn't be here when the police came around. Understand? No, I'm not sure I do. If I could get me a steak, now, I'd leave right away, tomorrow, maybe. That wouldn't take much. Four, five thousand, maybe, huh? That ought to be enough, uh, don't you think? Oh, now, wait a minute. Oh, better, better round it out to five. Yeah, five thousand would do her, Miss Runyon. Do you expect me to give you that money? Well, sure help if you did. But that's <laughs> impossible. I don't have a penny. You know, auction must have given you plenty, Miss Runyon. Why, Mr. Carlin bought some of your stock himself. But every cent goes to my father's creditors, and even that won't be enough. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is 5000 would do me just fine. Now, you think it over, Miss Runyon. I'll come back tomorrow afternoon. It won't do any good. We'll see. There's just no way I can raise that money, Mr. Fry. Oh, you'll find some way. Women these days, they can do just about everything. You know, fly airplanes, run companies, kill people. <laughs> well, you figure something out, Miss Runyon. Well, it's all now. No, wait, 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 Mr. Fryer, please. I'll... I'll see you in the morning. Oh, dear God. What am I going to do? And now, here's news on the local scene. The body of horseman Alan Winslow Carlin has been found in the ravine below Canyon Road. Colin, the victim of an auto crash that completely demolished his vehicle, had to be identified positively through examination of his dental records due to the condition of the body. An investigation by the State Highway Patrol is underway. Yes? Uh, Miss Runyon, my name is Sergeant Beggs. We uh, spoke on the phone earlier today. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Could I please come in? Well, if you're still worried about my horse, I told you that I did find him again. Oh, yes. Yes, miss, I know. Well, then, what's the trouble? Oh, nothing about the horse. It's uh, about your neighbor, as a matter of fact. If, if I could just uh, come in for a minute, please. Yes, of course. Thank you. I don't know if you uh, know the gentleman. Name of Carlin? Oh, yes, I know 
who he is. Wildbrook Farm. Yes, that's him. Matter of fact, I understand he uh, bought some of your horses at the auction last week. Yes, he did. But I uh, didn't handle the transaction myself. The auctioneer did all of that. Yes, yes, I understand. Well, then, what was it you wanted to ask me? Uh, you haven't been back home for some time, have you? It's close to two years. I came here when my father died suddenly. Yes, I know. And so I guess you uh, didn't see Alan Carlin in all that time? No. <laughs> Why in the world should I? Oh, I was just asking. Oh, Sergeant, I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Well, I've got something to tell you about Mr. Carlin. He's, uh, he's dead. He died in an auto crash this morning. Yes. Yeah. I just heard that on the news. Oh, I see, I see. Well, it was pretty bad. He was halfway up the canyon road, heading for the Leap. You know where the Leap is? Sergeant, I was born and raised in this part of the country. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Anyway, he went out driving that way, and he must have skidded or something. Car went over the edge, plowed right through the guardrail. Oh, that's terrible. It's such a dangerous road. Oh, yes, yes, it is a dangerous place. I would have thought Mr. Carlin would have had more sense than to take it at high speed or whatever it was he did. Anyway, the car went over, and it was totally demolished, of course, and that's uh, a long way down. Oh, that poor man. I'm terribly sorry about Mr. Carlin. But I really can't take his loss very personally. I hardly knew the man. Uh-huh. Uh, your father knew him well, though, didn't he? Uh, yes. They were neighbors for many years. And friends. Oh, I suppose so. Only they had some kind of falling out about money, I understand. Well, what does that have to do with all this? Just curious, Miss Runyon. Are you trying to imply something? <laughs> no, no, miss, of course not. Why should I do that? Oh, uh... There is just one more thing, though, one more thing. When Mr. Carlin left his place this morning, he told one of his servants that he was coming here to see you. Oh, that's right. He was here. Mm -hmm. What time would that have been? Oh, I don't remember exactly. Around 11, I think. Did he stay very long? No, no. No more than 10 minutes. I, I don't see the point of all these questions. Well, you see, we're just trying to understand what happened, Miss Runyon. Mr. Collin, he was a pretty careful driver. He knew that mountain road as good as anyone else in this part of the country. We were just wondering if he might have been, well, oh, let's say overtired or drinking too much or depressed, you know, anything like that. Um, how did he seem to you? Mm, I, I, I just don't recall. I see. And I guess that's all for now. What do you mean, for now? Oh, the highway patrol is investigating the accident, too. And since you were the last person to see Mr. Carlin, they might be talking to you, too, Miss Runyon. <coughs> oh. Is that the horse out there? One that got away? Yes. That's my horse. My, my, my. That's a fine-looking animal. Oh. I guess he's the only one. You didn't sell off, huh? That's right. The only one, Sergeant. But, uh, I, I might not keep him after all. Well, hello, Miss Ryan. Hello, Mr. Fry. Come in. Ah, thank you, thank you. Well... Sure, nice morning we had, wasn't it, huh? I didn't notice. <laughs> sure, glad it warmed up some. <laughs> I had to walk over to Mr. Carlin's place. <laughs> that old nag of mine finally broke down. <laughs> hmm. Coffee, I smell? Yes. Um, would you like a cup? <laughs> well, I sure wouldn't mind. How do you take it? Uh, black, just fine. Oh, thank you, miss. That's real nice of you. Ah, that's good. Well, now, I understand the police were around yesterday. You don't miss very much, do you, Mr. Fryer? Pays to keep your eyes open, I say. Oh, yes, I'm sure it does. Now, the question is, how much does it pay? Mr. Fryer, I don't have the money you want. 
Well, now that's a real bad piece of news, Miss Runyon. I told you yesterday there's simply no way for me to get my hands on it. The money that came to the estate through the sale of the ranch and its stock went directly into escrow. And I wouldn't know about fancy words like that, miss. All I know the is The estate that... has no money. And I have no money of my own. Well, that's really too bad. Because that means I can't leave. And if I can't leave, I might just as well tell the police what I saw. I'm hoping that you don't do that, Mr. Fryer. Oh, I don't want to do it. Believe me, Miss Runyon. But if there was just, just something you could give me. I mean, there must be something your pa left you. Huh? man like your daddy wouldn't die and leave his only child nothing at all. Well, there is one thing. Hey, what's that? It's the only legacy I have. The most valuable thing he owned. Look, out the window. That horse, you mean? Yes. His name is Stargazer. A thoroughbred. A champion. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's some stallion, all right. You said you were a good judge of horse flesh. How much do you think he's worth? Well, I wouldn't know for sure. I've I... been told he's worth between eight and ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Hey, a man would be mighty proud to own a horse like that, right? Well... He's all yours, Mr. Fryer. What? I'll transfer my ownership to you. Right this minute. Oh, you... You really mean that? Oh, why, that would be real fine, Miss Runyon. That, that would be real kind of you to do that. It won't take more than a few minutes for me to prepare the papers. Oh, I'd really appreciate that, Miss Runyon. You know, I'd sure like to take him out for one last ride before the sun goes down. And, of course, that's just what happened, Judge Simmons. Sam Fryatt took Stargazer out for his very last ride. <laughs> Remember all the old cowboy movies that showed the lone rider heading into the setting sun? Well, you can picture old Sam Fryatt doing exactly that. Only when the words that say, the end, appear on the screen, you can also be sure they mean the end of old Sam Fryatt. I'll be back shortly. you enjoyed this radio mystery story we hope you're enjoying the magic of radio itself magic which produces the most gigantic stage of all a stage large enough for one galloping horse or an entire herd of galloping horses this is E.G. Marshall asking you to tune in will someone please head those horses off at the pass our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Arnold Moss, William Redfield, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. They'll never be satisfied. But we got him out of the country. What's to keep him from coming back when he's broke or even threatening us from abroad? I gave him a thousand dollars in cash only a few days ago. When he was picked up in the bar, he had only about 270-some dollars left. In a matter of two days, he'd squandered over 700. But if he were made to understand that the sum agreed on was all he was going to get... Can I make you understand? We're not dealing with a rational, honest man. He'll agree to anything. When his money runs out or he decides he wants more, he'll, he'll be right back. What can you do? There are only... Two things one can do about a black man. I keep on paying and paying forever. And the other? And the other? Kill him. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... 
pleasant dreams?